So I just finished registering you guys right there. I was pre-registered. And uh, I got this awesome name tag right there. That's the hashtag. It's uh, Elevate. So obviously that's what we're here to do. All right, you guys, so um, I'm going to share with you some of the things I picked up from this um, uh, lecture here. Basically, that um, every patient needs to be asked about their physical activity habits by their physician. I thought that was really cool when you get a checkup, you know, if a person's fit, you know, that, that should be, it's, it's like health is a vital sign, fitness and so forth. Um, and also that um, one thing I really thought was interesting, you guys know I, I'm into cycling, I do triathlons and that kind of thing, right? Um, I'm also into resistance training too, which is really what this conference is going to be. A lot of talks will be about that in the upcoming days. But cycling was very has been shown to improve Parkinson's disease symptoms, and uh, I'll try and put that study actually right here. I'll pop it up. But I thought it was phenomenal. If I had to take a guess, I think cycling, just with the high cadence or even just moving the legs in that motion, number one, when you're cycling on a, on, a, on, a, on a road bike or a mountain bike, you have to stabilize yourself. So that's a neurological function right there in and of itself. We take that for granted, you know. It's like when somebody says, um, you know, it's as easy as riding a bike or like you remember, right? It's like muscle memory. So um, there's a neurological effect of cycling in and of itself that we take for granted once we learn it. But then also the cadence, you know, uh, muscle contraction, RPMs, that's, that's neurological too. So uh, nonetheless, I thought that was fascinating, uh, and it's right up my alley. That's like in my wheelhouse, so to speak, considering I just hit that 20.4 average for the 11-mile race at the wool market. Um, so anyway, uh, oh, and diabetes costs $100 billion. It's the most expensive medical condition. Um, just shows the importance. This exercise is medicine was the main theme, so... So we are here in Minneapolis, and here's the study we're looking at, and you are... Joe Watso. Nice to meet you. University of Delaware. Hi. Fantastic. So could you just uh, briefly explain, I guess, the purpose and what you found? Because I think that's fascinating, and, and, and the importance of hydration, actually, right? Right. So there's a lot of work being done looking at how the cardiovascular system responds to moderate and severe dehydration. And what we were interested in was looking at to see if just mild forms of dehydration impair cardiovascular control of the circulation. Mm -hmm. So here we're looking at blood pressure reactivity. So essentially what we did was we had individuals undergo a normal hydration condition and a dehydration condition. Mm -hmm. And then we brought them in for testing. So we had them do hand grip exercise and we had some, them do some other uh, sympathoexcitatory maneuvers. And what we found was that there's some exaggerations in both sympathetic nervous system outflow. So this is derived from the brain sending signals out to the body to constrict blood vessels. Uh -huh. And we're finding that this is potentially impacting blood pressure responses. So we can see that there's greater changes in blood pressure in response to hand grip exercise when right. individuals are dehydrated. So we think this is important because exaggerated blood pressure responses are associated with cardiovascular events. Yes. So we think this bridges some potential interesting information between just mild forms of dehydration and impairments in cardiovascular regulation. Thank you. What was the dehydration uh, protocol? What did they do to uh, restrict water? Right. So a lot of studies have used uh, exercise or exercise in the heat mm -hmm. in addition to water restriction over a certain amount of time. So to reduce the potential confounding effects of exercise or heat, uh -huh. we just did a 16-hour water deprivation. So it's just like not having dinner, any water with your dinner or throughout the night and then waking up in the morning to come in for testing. Unbelievable. That that small of a, of a reduction. And I will tell you that personal experience. I also find that whenever I'm dehydrated, I feel kind of stressed. 
And so this kind of parallels with the sympathetic system stimulation and overactivation. And so being hydrated uh, tends to have a, a, a normalizing effect, right, yeah. which is fascinating. Yeah, there's some interesting work, even with cognitive function potentially being impaired in young, healthy adults, even right. just mild forms of dehydration. So I still think sodium control is important, but we want to also hydrate ourselves. It can have a healthy flushing effect and a, a kind of a homeostatic uh, uh, sustenance within the body, right? Right, yeah, staying hydrated is particularly important, yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks. Alright you guys, so I was just in the uh, seminar for the role of resistance training in preventing disease and, uh, or disease prevention and treatment and it was a fascinating presentation uh, by all speakers. Uh, the speaker who really caught my attention was Dr. Peterson, in fact I had a question. But the question I asked her was, um, because what, what was shown was that interleukin-6 has traditionally been viewed as a pro-inflammatory, um, uh, uh, I think myokine that could secrete it by macrophages, but what's interesting is her research has shown that when it's stimulated through exercise, it takes a TNF independent pathway. In other words, tumor necrosis factor has been associated with systemic inflammation and um, exercise stimulates the interleukin-6 without, I guess, without cascading or also being triggered with tumor necrosis factor, which is fascinating. My question was, is there any association with uh, the interleukin-6 stimulation of exercise in, in relation to stimulating the body's endogenous an antioxidant system? In other words, could this mild inflammatory response from exercise stimulate your body's own antioxidant uh, pathways? Because we have endogenous antioxidants and we have exogenous, which is what we eat. Um, and she did not know of any, I guess, data or studies that are looking at that, which to me is pretty fascinating in the sense that it was pretty cool to kind of dig deep into asking that question, and I'll probably research it myself. But um, anyway, it was a fantastic presentation, so I just wanted to share that with you guys. I hate sport. You heard me right, I just hate sport. But although I hate sport, the fact is that I'm convinced by data. I'm convinced by the science. It appears that if you exercise, your lifespan will be five years longer and you will have 10 more years without disease than those who have a lazy lifestyle. Exercise protects against more than 35 different disorders and diseases. Exercise protects against type 2 diabetes, elevated blood pressure, cancer, heart disease, just to mention a few. And there's even evidence that if you exercise, it can be used as a medicine for the treatment of chronic diseases. You may think, as I do, that you are not the sporty type, or you may think that you do not have time for exercise. But the fact is that those who think they do not have time for exercise will sooner or later have to find time for illness. Today, more people than ever are very fit. And at the same time, more people than ever are very unfit. And millions of people are going to die prematurely because they do not exercise. Most people know that it's important to exercise uh, they think they have to exercise to fight obesity, but that's totally wrong. Being obese may not necessarily be a problem, but being unfit is a problem. So this is a very fascinating study, and it was uh, conducted by? Uh, I'm Vincent Chen. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. So can you just briefly explain what you were telling me before about uh, this? Um, is it the... The uh, PPAR gamma, right? PPAR delta. delta, yeah, PPAR which is delta. most 
most um, abundant in, pea in, part in, in your muscle. Yes. yes. Uh, so, uh, pea part delta protein is the most abundant uh, pea part protein in muscle. Mm -hmm. And uh, people used to think that only endurance exercise can increase pea part delta. And what we found is that re with resistant exercise training, uh, your pea part delta protein will increase. So, pea part delta protein uh, basically its function is to regulate the pea metabolism in your body. So. Uh, what we found here was with uh, just one bout of resistant exercise training, your pea part delta increase uh, when adjusted to body fat percentage. So uh, what we found is the more body fat in your body you have, uh, the less increase of pea part delta. Wow. Protein. So that means that resistance training might have more of a uh, fat loss effect in those who are leaner with less body fat. Exactly. Which is what you found. Yeah. Wow. So it might be the reason that uh, people with more fat yeah. present body fat. And in it's your more body. difficult to lose weight right. with resistance at the, training. Yeah, at the at the beginning. Ah, so after yes. ten weeks of training we found that no matter what your body fat is uh -huh. and no matter what your gender is, uh, your body your P part delta increase no matter uh, how much your body fat is. It's independent of body fat percentage. So, so after 10 weeks, a longer period of time, mm -hmm. there, there was an increase in the PPAR delta? Yes. In both, okay, in, in, irrespective of body yeah, fat? Yeah, no, no matter, how, no matter uh, how much your body fat is. Okay. Yeah. Good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And as you're going to see here, uh, a drug that was developed to PPAR delta can diffuse through the membrane of the uh, fat cell and bind to the PPAR delta receptor, very similar to what we saw with PPAR gamma. Uh, now we're looking at PPAR delta networks in muscle. Uh, it triggers the same type of effect, very similar receptor, uh, the conformational change, the repressors released, the genetic activation system uh, comes in, and now the muscle energy burning genes uh, are stimulated, and the muscle delta network is stimulated uh, to activate oxidative metabolism uh, in uh, this tissue leads to a change in balance uh, of its energy composition as this network uh, flickers on and off and as these genes uh, are going. Uh, and thus, tinkering with the molecular machinery can cause the increased burning uh, of fat and adipose tissue. So I'm here with... I'm Caitlin Thomas. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And your paper was on the associations of physical activity and it's with other biomarkers. And one, and one of them was adiponectin and IGF-1. But we were just discussing IGF-1, and you said something about a, a study you found on mice. So there was a study I read that um, was looking at mice, and they gave them just IGF-1, and then they gave them IGF-1 and did a bout of exercise. And um, they were looking at sarcopenia and muscle mass. Mm -hmm. and the increase in muscle mass with IGF-1 and exercise was significantly greater than when the mice were just given IGF-1. Wow. So that means they, they, it was interesting, they kind of facilitated the expression of IGF-1, mm -hmm. like peripherally, whereas the mice who were IGF-1 and sedentary, they didn't get a, a muscle building response. Right. Wow. So it's amazing how things can, in synergy, the outcomes can be different versus you know, isolation. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome.